That's like FIFA level numbers. Like that's like if you're going to play a game of FIFA or EAFC 24 now, like that's the numbers you're putting up on like beginner level difficulty with <laughs> with players. Like that's that's just like a video game level stat. I don't understand how that's happening. Hello friends, this is the It's Called Soccer podcast. I'm your host Jake Landau, and joining me as always is my good friend, US soccer super nerd, self-proclaimed and soon to be total eclipse enjoyer Tom Godden. If you haven't seen me for a while, uh, there's a very good reason. You can watch the full video on our YouTube page. But essentially, I was working at Men and Blazers since last summer. It just got to be an all-consuming job. And I'm going back to be a CFP financial planner. So with that, it means I not only have more time to focus on my own content, but it also means I'm so excited to be back and equipped with some new abilities to power up the show and everything on the YouTube channel. So with that, I love you all. Thank you for being back here with us. And if you're new here, don't worry about any of that. We've got you covered with the biggest stories in U.S. soccer. Today on the podcast, we're covering Christian Pulisic's incredible form at Milan this season after his 10th goal against Lecce. Haji Wright has continued his dominance in the championship after scoring the winning goal against Leeds. All my homies hate Leeds, Tom. We have a Tyler Adams injury update from the Bournemouth manager, Ricardo Pepe and his agent are asking PSV for more playing time. Manchester City has purchased the 14-year-old American Kevin Sullivan, who is expected to sign the largest homegrown deal in MLS history with the Philadelphia Union. And finally, the U.S. women's national team advanced to the final of the She Believes Cup after their close win against Japan. Let's start chirping. Tom, it's been a while. What's going on with you? Not much. I'm so glad to be back. It feels like it's been forever since we talked. This is so exciting to get a chance to just chat about everything. Been been a great couple of months. Discovered a Neutron Star. Got my first paper published. Casual stuff that happens in life these days. But super happy to be back and talking about U.S. soccer and happy to get ready to get into it. What does it mean to discover a Neutron Star? I wrote this code that predicted where we should see these binary star systems in a neighboring galaxy to the U.S. and predicted that these there were six stars that should be uh, have a binary a neutron star that was orbiting them, and we could tell if one of them went into outburst that they would be real. And lo and behold, one of my six stars that I said was going to be a neutron star binary went into outburst three months later, um, became the. Th- 145th of these ever found and the third ever found to have eclipses where the neutron star was actually blocking light from its star that we could see from here on earth so it was an amazing thing dude that was huge. a crazy first pa- it was a crazy first paper to get out yeah um i'll have, make sure to post the link to the archive and discord so people can check it out but yeah i've been really excited about that huge for my career <laughs> so am i talking to the Kevin sullivan of space <laughs> physicists like, are you about to get I, picked up by the secret organization behind NASA <laughs> that's like even bigger and funded by the entire planet's defense systems? <laughs> Maybe not quite that big, but it was it was it felt like I had uh, grown a level in my prospect status. <laughs> amazing, amazing! And you're still up at Penn State. Yep, still over here in State College, a couple hours from you, enjoying life in the very frigid north. <laughs> Cool. Well, we are recording this on Sunday, one day before the eclipse that's coming to the northeast of the United States. What's your plan? Headed up to New York. We're going to drive until we get sunshine, uh, assuming that's possible. I'm not sure it's going to be possible, but, you know, we're hoping for the best. It's going to be a fantastic time. If you're near the path of totality, I cannot recommend enough. Go see the eclipse. It will be super cool. Make sure you have a pair of eclipse glasses handy because you will want those as well. Um, but yeah, exciting. To, we'll see if we get anything or not. Please do not uh, blind and damage your retinas <laughs> by looking directly at the sun. Even if you think that there's a little sliver uh, and it's dark out, you will damage your eyes. So please be careful. Um, okay, public health service announcement <laughs> over. Let's talk about Christian Pulisic and his left-footed goal against Lecce. 16 goal contributions on the year in Serie A this season, Tom. 10 goals, 6 assists. From your perspective, what's been the secret to Pulisic kind of unlocking himself, not just for Milan, but he's been a difference maker for the United States as well this season? I I don't know if we even have unlocked him, have we? I, I feel like we're still only seeing like 50% of what we can actually get out of him. I, it seems like Milan's offense doesn't really run through him these days. Are 
Do you think that Milan is, is that a fully unlocked? Like, I'm not, if I don't he's think playing it is. on the right, you have one of the best young players, Rafael Leao, on the left. You have Giroud scoring goals for fun, the future LAFC striker. Like, I would maybe not unlock to his full potential, but we're certainly seeing more of him than we did in his Chelsea days. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. I am really, really happy to see him scoring for fun in Serie A. It's been awesome to watch him be dangerous. He, you know, he was always dangerous in the dribble, but I think he's unlocked a lot better, shooting a lot better, finishing. His left foot has become a weapon, which I didn't ever see that being a thing at Chelsea or at Dortmund. Um, I really, really enjoy watching his off-ball movement too, which has always been his strength for me, but I think he's gotten so much better at it. He just sort of is constantly making these unselfish off-ball runs, and when they're rewarded, he's doing fantastic. But it doesn't feel like they're being rewarded enough for me. I love that uh, during his Dortmund and Chelsea days, his way of scoring goals, and even for the U.S. team, there was like a running joke that if Pulisic didn't fall down while scoring, (laughs) then it wasn't a Pulisic goal. And it was always on the back post. He was running onto something. He'd be tackled at the last second or the goalkeeper would take him out. And if he didn't fall down during the goal, then it wasn't a Pulisic goal. But now, like... The goals that he's scoring, I think the first one of the season was outside the box, the one that he just scored against Lecce. He dipped his shoulder, went left, rocket of a left foot. We'll talk about that in a second from outside the box again. There's like a new a new uh, perspective or a new way that Pulisic seems to be scoring goals and kind of contributing to the team. You mentioned maybe they're not seeing the results, but I would argue like Milan are solidly in second place in Serie A behind the league leaders, and it sucks for them, but their local rivals enter. There's not really going to be anyone that catches them. Juventus is in third, but they're like 10 points behind. And AC Milan themselves are like 10 points behind Inter. So they're kind of locked into that second place. They were going to be one of the favorites to win the league, but again, probably not going to happen this season. What are your thoughts? Like, what... Is it an additional piece of Pulisic that needs to be unlocked, or is it the team that's letting him down? What's kind of the point that you're trying to make? I think it's the team that's letting him down. I think it's people just not recognizing when he's open or the runs he's making. Every time I watch Milan, I'm sitting there screaming, pass the ball, pass the ball, he's open, pass the ball, and no one ever makes the pass. Ruben Loftus' cheek sort of gets tunnel vision when he gets near the box. Leao tends to go hero ball mode a little bit too much for me. It just sort of seems like... Pulisic makes these beautiful, unselfish runs that constantly get him open, but either Loftus-Cheek is looking the wrong direction or looking to put his head down and shoot, or Leao is doing something on the left side where he's going to try and take three guys on and doesn't see the run coming, and you sort of get this beautiful, unselfish run that goes unrewarded several times a game. I mean, Pulisic is only averaging two shots a game right now in Serie A, which is crazy for how much off-the-ball work he does. Yeah. It's true. It's funny that you say that because Milan, like maybe they're not an elite team, but they're probably one of the 20 best clubs in the world. So to have players that can't find everyone, wonder if like Arsenal or Manchester City is actually a place where like if they bought him back and brought him back to the Premier League, could be a place where there's like the Kevin De Bruyne's, the uh, Kai Havertz now, I guess, is a or Odegaard, like someone will find him. I I think Mm. Milan has been a really good place for him in terms of just his development and getting, I think something that was really important this year was just getting him back into like a comfort zone because when he came back to the United States national team, when playing for Chelsea, it was like, there was this pressure by having the pressure off. Like he was coming back to the national team and that was his place of Zen, but it was like, he had so much other stuff going on at Chelsea and like, that was so much of the conversation where now he's in form with Milan. Yunus Musa's is there. Yunus Musa, by the way, is not uh, someone that's innocent from not finding pool of six run. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I think there was a, <laughs> yeah, there was a gif in the U S soccer subreddit maybe two weeks ago where Yunus Musa had a, an insane dribble as he does transitioning the ball from defense to the middle of the pitch. And Pulisic is like open for five seconds and Musa <laughs> just takes four or five extra touches loses the ball, doesn't land into anything, but he's kind of grouped into that. I will say, like, Yunus yeah. Musa is one of my favorite players, but he's still super young and needs to learn how to just pull the trigger a little bit earlier. 
Yeah. No, if I, I, I'm not saying it's bad. I think that there's just more work to do. I think Milan can still get a lot better if they just sort of start recognizing where these players are open. I mean, Christian Pulisic played the 10 yesterday and completed 12 passes through the entire match. Like, that's that's crazy. You would think that if you're running the offense through a 10, you would want them to be on the ball more, and it just sort of seems like they can never find him when he's open. I mean, he's only averaging 27 completed passes a game. That's, that's nothing in terms of a, a full 90 soccer match. Like, he's just not... We're just not seeing enough of it. I think Milan, as good as they are right now, that's, the, that's where you're going to unlock the final form of Christian Pulisic, where you're going to see what he can really do, and that's where you're going to see how good Milan can really be. I think that you get them in that kind of form, and they could be competing for not just Serie A, but for Champions League trophy. Is there a code that you can write that can find the right player to surround Christian Pulisic at AC Milan? Find that neutron star that's perfect. <laughs> I wish that would be great. <laughs> I would make a lot uh, of money doing that too. <laughs> true, true, very true. Hey, that oil money, that uh, Saudi Arabian money at Newcastle—that's Thomas Godden's next next profession. Um, I mentioned he scored more than half his goals this season with his left foot. I wanted to ask, like, do you think he even has a weak foot at this point? Because I want to say too, there's there's a goal that kind of like identified or encapsulated his entire being at Chelsea, which was the left-footed rocket that he scored against Crystal Palace. And it was like, he scored it in back-to-back seasons, almost the exact same way where he went into the box, scored this left foot, like high near post goal. Um, It was a sign that his left foot was always there, but it feels like left or right, it doesn't really matter at this point. Oh yeah. I think that it's absolutely, um, true that he does not have a weak foot I mean, you can see it even when he plays for the u.s these days he had a shot i want to say against jamaica that was just an absolute rocket off the left foot that blake did really well to save that was just stunned that he got the amount of power he did off of his left i mean it just sort of seems like he has such good control on both feet it he's dangerous whether he's cutting in on both or his left or his right or being able to whip across him with either his left or his right as well so it just makes him a really versatile winger which is Great for us because it gives us a lot more options from where we can deploy him on the field. Yeah, for sure. All right. Like I said, Milan are solidly in second place in Serie A. They are in the Europa League as well after being dropped out of the Champions League. We'll see where they land at the end of the season. Moving north to the big island, Tom Haji Wright in the championship. I want to talk about him a little bit. Um, he had a goal, winning goal against Leeds. Like I said, all my homies hate Leeds. Every American <laughs> that I know that loves soccer, that loves Tyler Adams, Weston McKinney, Brendan Aronson, Jesse Marsh, uh, they they did us so dirty. So any leading goal, any winning goal against Leeds is good with me. The fact that Haji Wright scores it is uh, an extra cherry on top. This season, 21 goal contributions, 15 goals and six assists. Has Haji moved himself up to number one in the depth chart for the U.S. men's national team or is it still Balogun or Pepe? I would argue that we're placing Haji in the wrong spot in this conversation. I'm not sure how Berhalter sees it, but Haji's been doing all this as a winger. He's played his left wing for Coventry. I almost think his skill set lends itself better to a winger, so it seems like it might be a better conversation to have to ask where he is on the winger depth chart, particularly where Wea is not getting any minutes for Juve right now. Because it seems like that might be where he could be the most dangerous. I don't know if you agree or not, but in Nations League, it, the two goals he scored came as a left winger. He looks pretty dangerous playing sort of a tucked in second striker, hybrid wing type player. And we have the fullbacks to do it. Do you think that he is the striker of the future for us? Or do you think he is a solid third option on the left wing? I mean, at least with the national team, I saw him as like a left forward Mm-hmm. And it, also because he was in positions where we needed a goal, like against Jamaica, and then going into extra time, we just needed to push numbers forward. But then he started that game in the final. Um, it's it's 2024, Tom. <laughs> like, you know, J. Cole and Kendrick are beefing and putting <laughs> out diss tracks. Are, are positions in soccer even real at all? Like, does it matter if we call someone a striker or a left winger? Because for Haji, right, you're right. Like with Coventry, he's playing more on the left and cutting inside. The tough thing with Haji is that he has like the technical ability 
and the scoring production of a winger, but he has the body type and the physicality and the athleticism of a, of a big striker, like of an Olivier, Olivier Giroud. So it's hard for me to like place him in one position or the other. It's kind of, I would almost fall back on the, what does the game call for? Who are we playing against? Who are the defenders? What are their strengths and weaknesses? Because Pulisic, I would argue, his best position is on the left side of the three that we play. So if you have Haji Wright as slotted in as a left winger, does it mean putting Christian Pulisic on the right, which I'm not against because we've seen with Milan, like aside from this last weekend when he played the 10, that can definitely work. So it's kind of like, what does the opposition call for? And Haji Wright just gives us an extra wrinkle because he can play on that left side, whereas a lot of our strikers, like Josh Sargent is probably the most... <laughs> Now, I'm going to say this, but also last season for Norwich, like he was playing on the right wing for them. But I would argue he's lit, he's the most out-and-out out number nine that we have. Balogun with his speed and his ability to run him behind. I actually see a lot of his skill set as similar to Christian Pulisic. But I love him as a striker as well. Again, if if the team is kind of like pushing numbers forward or they're not playing a really deep parking-the-bus structure, Balogun is probably my favored number nine. So all of that was a cop out to say positions aren't real. Let's figure out who we're playing against and what we want our game plan to be, and then figure out around that what do our players give to the game. That's a great take, very nuanced one, and leads to a lot of room for discussion. So I, I, I like that. I I don't know. I think that that's the way, right way to look at it. We have so many good options, and it's kind of amazing looking back to some of the conversations we had leading up to the World Cup, where it was always this who's going to be our striker. We don't have any good strikers. Now we have four legitimately great strikers in Europe. And it's kind of a great problem to have where we don't know who should play, who should be on rosters, who we should be calling up, what the game state allows us to do with these different players. It's going to be really interesting to see how Burhalter deploys all of these options moving forward because, frankly, it's a really nice problem to have. The main reason I mentioned Haji as a winger, too, is that just our winger depth is so bad right now. It's Pulisic, Wea, and then who comes after that? Kevin Paredes, Brendan Kevin Aronson, Paredes, yeah. Alex and Zendejas. Like, these are not great options. If we could slot in a player who's scoring for fun in the championship, that's a much better option to me than a lot of these either really raw young players or guys who are just getting it done for Club America. Like, that's... It would be nice to have that versatility on the rosters moving forward. So, you mentioned the yeah. the number nine conversations going into the World Cup, and I think it's funny now because people have completely forgotten about and don't even need to talk about anymore. Jesus Ferreira, <laughs> like he's completely fallen off the map. He's not one of the elite strikers in MLS. Uh, FC Dallas is not a you know amazing team this season in Major League Soccer. Like Jesus Ferreira, someone that we saw as the Pirate of the Caribbean, he was saving us in all the gold cups and everything. Like the fact that we have four great strikers legitimately playing and producing in Europe, that kind of takes all the pressure off of us as fans to be like, can we find that third or fourth person that can figure out how to break down defenses or like give us a little something extra? I think the fact that we have Balogun, Haji Wright, Pepe, and Sargent. And then some others like that are really talented and young coming up. It kind of takes the onus off that conversation just to be like, all right, we have four great ones. There's no wrong answer, but it's more about like who's in form, who are we playing against and who's, who's healthy, like who's available. Josh Sargent, I would have loved to see him at, at the nation's league. Um, I thought he had a great world cup tournament before he got injured. And we saw kind of how much we missed that in the game against the Dutch. Um, now, in terms of ranking them and thinking about who's number one, how do you, Tom, you're like a very stat-heavy nerd person, uh, nerd <laughs> person. How do you view the production in different leagues for our striker pool? Like, Haji Wright and Josh Sargent are in the championship together, so they're playing against the same same competition. Josh Sargent has 14 goals and one assist this season. Uh, Ricardo Pepe is in their divise in the Champions League. He has eight goals and two assists in both competitions, but he's barely getting any playing time. We'll talk about that in a second. And then Balogun is one of our most hyped products, but he has seven goals and three assists in Liga. So how do you kind of spread out the production of our strikers and across the different leagues and competitions that they're playing against to say like, 
okay, this this means more than this other person scoring against these other teams. I feel like it's hard to a certain point to compare very different leagues. Like there's no way to, I guess there are formulas that try and do it, but none of them feel like they're really that accurate. And so after a certain point, the sort of numbers become meaningless and it's just sort of all vibes. Like this league is better than that league in my opinion. So I feel like you sort of have to set a baseline where we need you to be this productive as a striker. And if you're this productive, no matter what league you're in, as long as the league is a good league, then we should consider you. I don't know what that number should be. I, I've heard people throw around like 0.6 XG per 90 or something like that is like a good number, but I haven't dug, dug into it enough. But that would be sort of as far as I would go is to sort of look at the numbers and say, are they productive? Yes. And then from there, look and say, all right, what's the value of the league they're playing in? Sergeant Haji's nice. I've, they're playing the same teams. You can directly compare. You can look at their numbers directly and say, okay, this one has objectively better stats than this one. But once you go to different leagues, that becomes a lot murkier and leaves a lot of room for interpretation. So it's it's hard to sort of make that a full conversation. But I don't know. As long as you've got a striker who's playing well, you know, the hot hand plays. And so I'm fine with any of them right now. I mean, you can look into Pecky's and underlying numbers and they're just stupid good off the charts. But all the rest of them are producing great numbers as well. So it's hard to know if where to go with this conversation. If you're the technical analyst... If you're the technical analyst for the U.S. national team and you're helping make this decision, is MLS a good league? Are you putting them Ooh. in the good league? I I don't know. I MLS is getting a lot better. I mean, Opta, for the first time last, like two weeks ago, ranked them in the top 10 leagues in the world. I still think that's probably a we little made high. <laughs> Mama, we made it. <laughs> um, they had them ranked at 10 just below the Brazilian league, but ahead of Liga MX and ahead of Argentina. It was, it's, it's, it's growing. Get wrecked. <laughs> Dramatically. But yeah, like this is, it's getting to the point where a really good striker in MLS can legitimately be in that conversation and have an argument to play. I mean, we've talked about it before with people like Brandon Vasquez and Jesus Ferreira when they were lighting up MLS for fun. Like at this point, I'm not sure that the MLS is that much worse than the average air to VC team where you have to completely write them off. Now, obviously, PSV is a different story, but, you know, there, there's I think that like the league car conversation also goes into like arguments about like different team qualities because, you know, PSV is a lot different than Vitesse. I don't think Vitesse would make the MLS playoffs, but um, I yeah, so it, it's really hard to know. Like I, it's a case by case thing. It's sort of like the, the position conversation. You have to look at the team and how they're doing not just like the league they're playing in all right so you're saying jordan morris get your goals in and <laughs> climb up the depth chart to number one um just a quick update before we leave england tyler adams was unavailable for bournemouth yesterday he was out for over a year with the hamstring injury that he suffered um last year but he was out due to back spasms so Ariola, the bournemouth coach after the game just said he had back spasms during the week. They kept him out for precautionary reasons. Um, he's just returned, like I said, from that devastating hamstring injury. And we'll see what this means in terms of his timeline to get back. So, Tom, I just want to ask you, we saw at the Nations League how important he was for the U.S. And then Bournemouth went and started him and played him 90 minutes in a win when he was back available for them. We'll need to see how serious this is. But how critical is Tyler Adams to this U.S. national team being healthy for Copa America, now that we have other options that we haven't had in a long time, like Leonard Maloney, that's playing well in the Bundesliga. And then you have Johnny, who is just crushing it at Real Betis in La Liga now. Has Tyler Adams' importance to this team diminished, or is he just that good where we can play a different brand of football when he's here with us? He's just that good. I, I don't think there's any question about it. I mean, look at the way we played with him on the field versus Jamaica and versus Mexico. I thought we looked far better with him on the field than we did without him. We do have options. I think our Johnny is getting to the point where he's in that conversation, but I thought that when he came in versus Mexico, our level of play dropped a little bit just because he doesn't quite have the skill set that Tyler Adams has. He's a very different skill set, and some of the things he does that he does better than Tyler Adams. But... Tyler is such a destroyer. He erases so many problems on the field. I just don't know that there's anyone in the pool who can replicate what he does for the U.S. at all. It's it's so crucial. And I thought 
just bringing him on versus Jamaica stabilized the game and sort of allowed us to get our shape and go forward and actually have a chance to pull off the miracle. So for me, he's absolutely critical. That's not to say there are not other options coming up, but I don't think they're there yet. Are you, are you of the same mindset? Yeah. I mean, I'd hate to be Johnny or Leonard Maloney because you're like, come on, U.S., I'm three <laughs> times better than Kellen Acosta, but Tyler Adams is going to make me look bad. Like, it doesn't, yeah. you're not bad and you are not going to look good because Tyler Adams is just insanely talented. And, like, the way that he plays is so unique to Tyler Adams. If, if everyone, you know, was wearing a mask and everyone had the same body type on camera, like watching a game, you would still be able to tell, okay, that is Tyler Adams. He's making that run or he's protecting that player, that ball. That is Tyler Adams and nobody else. Like I can't even think of outside the national team, even club level at the elite level. Like I know Tyler Adams is playing at Bournemouth, not one of the greatest teams in the world, but I could see him, making the leap again, going back to a big, big team, if he can continue to be healthy and have this level of play, like there is genuinely nobody like Tyler Adams. And again, if you're Johnny or Leonard Maloney, you're like, well, I'm just going to be the backup for the rest of my life until Tyler Adams is unavailable. Um, So yeah, I do agree with you. Like Tyler Adams is just that good. It's probably like how, you know, your peers feel when they're sitting next to you, Tom, and they're like, this guy, this guy discovered a neutron star with his first paper, and I'm supposed to compete with that. <laughs> oh, my my colleagues do? are doing fantastic <laughs> stuff. It Penn State's a place a lot like uh, a big club in soccer where everyone's doing that stuff. So, <laughs> uh, and and you're just as humble as Tyler Adams is as well. Um, speaking about humble, let's talk about Ricardo Pepe asking for more playing time at PSV. Um, we mentioned him in the striker conversation because. Um, well, now, last week, his agent made headlines when he publicly stated that Ricardo Pepe is frustrated with his playing time at PSV. Um, Ricardo Pepe has only played 391 minutes in the league this season, but he does have seven goals and one assist in that time, which is just an insane striking rate. I want to ask you, Tom, does Pepe have an argument to make here? Because for context, the striker that he's asking to be ahead of at club is the captain and legend of the club, Luke De Jong. De Jong this season has 23 goals and 11 assists in the league so far this season. And PSV are just tearing apart the league. With five games left, uh, PSV are 12 points ahead of Feyenoord at the time of this recording. So, yeah, does Ricardo Pepe have a case to make here when Luke De Jong, the player in front of him, is just the Tyler Adams of PSV? <laughs> I mean, not really. Luke De Jong has 32 total goals, 14 total assists. He scores one more goal. This is the most goals he's ever scored in a season. He's already broken his own record for the most assists he's ever put scored in a season. The only, only thing that Pepe has to hang on to is that Luke De Jong is old, and he is getting older every single year. He's going to be 34 at the start of the next season. Can he be Tim Ream, or is he eventually going to start to show his age? Seems to be the only question that... I- like Pepe, you can hang on to right now. Like I love that Tim Ream right? is the ageless one now. <laughs> like he's an easy reference. Uh, yeah, that's the great re- greatest reference to have in your back pocket at this point for older players. Like, can you do what Tim Ream did? <laughs> like, that's the baseline now. Um, it's the same age too, but at this point, it's will when will he slow down? Not will he pick it up to a new level? Um, I this is, he. Picked it up from a level from last year. If you had looked at last where we were at the beginning of this year, we were not having we were having a very different conversation about Ricardo Pepe because, well, Luke De Jong didn't have this year last year. This year has been like off the charts good for PSV, and it just kind of sucks for Pepe because there's not much you can do when your starting striker is just that lethal, right? I mean, this is insane. It did come out of nowhere, but it also kind of didn't. Like, from my perspective, I thought Ricardo Pepe was joining PSV to learn under the tutelage of Luke de Jong for one or two years until de Jong kind of aged out and you could kind of little by little give Pepe more minutes in the cup games and maybe, you know, if they're about to win the league with four or five games to go, you give Pepe a little bit more time, you rest Luke de Jong for the Champions League that you have. So in my mind, it's kind of like, how can you ask for more playing time 
when the player in front of you has 30 plus goal contributions, <laughs> is the captain of the team, and you join the club like with that expectation. But again, I don't know the conversations that they were having with Ernie Stewart when they signed for PSV, but that seemed to me to be what the the kind of like going into this was, is learn from Luke for a little bit. You'll get some minutes, and he has, and he's done really well with the minutes, but how can you ask to be, how can you say you're frustrated when the player in front of you is just like having one of the greatest seasons in Dutch league history? That's true. Although my big complaint is, I don't understand why PSV is playing De Jong as much as they are. Like, they'll be up 5-1 and De Jong will be, have a hat trick, and they'll still leave him into, like, the 87th minute. <laughs> like, it Pete, feels like again, after he gets Peter the hat Bush, trick. A U.S. legend of, like, managing <laughs> Gio Reyna and Christian was I don't know if he was there when Christian Pulisic was there, but all these coaches are just rearing their ugly heads again know. at, you know, mismanaging these U.S. players. But Serginho Dest and Malik Tillman, we can't really fault. Uh, they're just having insane seasons. Well, yeah. I think I read again on the U.S. Soccer subreddit that uh, the three Americans have 30-plus goal contributions themselves <laughs> when combined. That's so insane. Great pickups well, for Pepe, PSV. Pepe himself is setting just stupid numbers up. Like I, His per 90 stats are like off the charts. Like Can't even compare them to any realistic soccer player levels. Like he's at 1.62 XG per 90. Like That's... <laughs> that's insane. That's that's better than Lionel Messi or Kylian Mbappe. <laughs> yes, those are that is the best number in the world. It's not even really close. Um, I was so how, how I thought should it was, we think about that then? Like that's that's like FIFA level numbers. Like that's like if you're going to play a game of FIFA or EAF, EAFC twenty four now. Like that's the numbers you're putting up on like beginner level difficulty with with players. Like that's. That's just like a video game level stat. I don't understand how that's happening beyond the fact that he's just like the game state that he's always coming into is one where he just gets so many opportunities. But still, like that's it would not be the same if it were over a full season. But that's the numbers you need if you're playing behind the best striker in Dutch history. Yeah, I guess at least he's (laughs) asking and saying he's frustrated while also being like, I can do this. And I've yeah. shown you rather yeah. than having like zero goal contributions be like, please play me. Why, yeah. why aren't I playing? <laughs> no, I mean, it's he's at least doing the right things where with a second that De Jong's form fades at all, he's right there. Like, it's not like there's going to be a battle. The second that there is an argument to be made, Pepe is right there to take over. Like there's, he's, ha- he's playing that well. It's just that the guy he's playing behind is playing even better than that somehow. What's what's with these agents for the U.S. <laughs> national team? You got Gio Reyna going to Nottingham Forest and not getting any playing time. I mean, Matt Turner goes to the same team that buys three goalkeepers in one year and gets gets ousted. Like what? Ethan Horvath, even what is happening with our agents, our player agents? Well, we've gotten rid of some of the worst ones, but apparently there's still some to go that are just not really helping their clients out that much. You would think that that would you some of these moves would be obvious, but I don't know. Also, I think Reina's agent is actually Claudio these days, so that one might make a little bit more sense. Oh. But. <laughs> well, now now we're now it's called soccer podcast is clapping at Claudio. Wouldn't be the All first right. time we've done that. Speak- <laughs> True, true. Speaking of agents, I want to talk about Kevin Sullivan, a 14-year-old in the Philadelphia Union's academy system. He signs for Manchester City this week. He'll sign the largest homegrown deal in MLS history. Kevin is the younger brother of Philadelphia Union player Quinn Sullivan. The deal up front is going to cost City between $1 and $2 million, but it can rise up to $5 million with add-ons, and the Union will retain a hefty sell-on clause as well. So, what expectations are too big for Kevin? Is is he the future face of U.S. soccer? It's so hard to tell. Someone was asking me this conversation on a, uh, this topic on a Discord the other day. They asked like when we can expect him to start for the U.S. and I just kind of want to pump the brakes <laughs> a little bit on it. Like, yeah, you know, he's fourteen years old. He's he's just so young. There's just no telling what's going to happen with him. He could have a massive injury he could just sort of age 
to a level where he doesn't grow as much. We know development's not linear. We I mean, he could decide that he all of a sudden really loves baking and decide to go do something else besides soccer. Like it's he's so young. Like normally I have a policy of I don't talk about a player until they are eligible to receive their driver's driver's license. But Sullivan's the exception where you kind of can't do anything besides mention. You him. can't avoid and, you, yeah, the, conversation. the, the conversation's out there. Like he's the only fourteen-year-old in the world, I think, with a Wikipedia page for soccer. Um, <laughs> like this, it's kind of insane the level of like hype around him. So it's going to be hard to stop that. But I do think there needs to be some level of pump the brakes on this because he, there's so much that can happen, and he still has never played like against grown men in professional soccer situations. He'll get that this he, year. He's had but... one appearance in MLS Next Pro. So he's, and that was he's against faced another two teams. Once. Yeah, that was against another <laughs> two team too. And the two teams don't necessarily have a lot of grown men. I'm yeah. actually really, I'm going to sound comp- incredibly biased when I say this, but I'm really interested to see how he does against Chattanooga FC because playing them will be a completely different experience than playing the other two teams. I mean, their starting center back is six foot four, 250 pound, 30 year old Moldovan dude. And they have a you're, Trinidad you're saying Tobago two teams, inter- uh, like MLS has a second team, but for Chattanooga, yes. they're like a fully professional side. Yes, that's what you're yes. saying. Yes, yeah. So the the in MLS Next Pro, the way it works is that every team is a youth team or a reserve team, except for Chattanooga FC and Carolina Core, who are fully independent pro teams who build their roster very differently with grown men who actually you know are professionals and have been for years and have played in every USL league under the sun. I mean, Chattanooga itself has a a starter for the Moldovan national team, 6'4", 250 pounds, 30 years old. And they have a Trinidad and Tobago starter at, at right back. So, like, those are the teams that I'm really looking to see what Sullivan can do something against because those are the teams that have full professionals that he's going to be going up against. I mean, to your point on on when does he join the U.S. national team, I actually think this is a different conversation today in 2024 than it was when like Christian Pulisic was coming up and Mm -hmm. we were on the the World Cup qualifying campaign in 2018 because at that point Pulisic is 17 he's starting to get starts and score for Dortmund and we kind of needed him because there wasn't really like it was the Michael Bradley Dempsey era where like everyone was 32 33 34 we didn't really have a core of players that were like 24 to 30 in their prime. Mm-hmm. And Christian Pulisic was one of the best players that probably should have been starting for a lot of that World Cup qualifying campaign. We kind of needed him in that sense. Where I think where we are now, we don't necessarily need Kevin Sullivan to be like the savior right away. We can give him a few years, even to the point where he's 18, 19, 20, because at his position in like a midfielder or a wide forward, we have great players. We have Christian Pulisic. We have Eunice Musa, we have Wesley McKinney. Like, Kevin Sullivan doesn't need to be immediately the savior, where it was a kind of different conversation back in 2017 when we were trying to qualify and we were failing at that. Um, So I do want to kind of, like, scope this conversation in the the sense of, like, there's going to be a lot of comparisons, right, to Freddie Adu, who made his MLS debut at 14. Um, Are there any lessons to be learned from the story of Freddie Adu, or is what I kind of just said, the more mature point where U.S. soccer is now in a place where there's not that much pressure to be special because we have we have Champions League winners. We have special players. Maybe they're not in the top five or ten in the world, but we have a genuinely dangerous team now. I, I think that there are lessons still to be learned because I think despite all that, there still is a very large contingent of U.S. fans who are looking for a savior still. There still is a group who are looking for um, someone to take the U.S. to the next level, even beyond the one we're at. Like, we have role players and contributors besides Pulisic and McKinney, really, right now for big clubs and always have, or at least have for these last few years. But there's, we're still looking for someone to become truly, like, world class, to become legitimately one of the best players in the world at their position. And those hopes are going to keep getting hung on every new kid who comes through just because that's what fans want they want that that player to come in and be the 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 stud the the, the phenom that everyone in the world knows about and i, I want to pump the brakes some on that like type of language because i just don't think that it's 
healthy for Sullivan. I don't think it's healthy for the fans to be hanging this pressure on 14 year olds. I, I don't know. It's, it's hard with these youth players because anytime you have a player that good, they're going to get hyped, but I don't think that the level of hype we're putting on them is good for them. Yeah. I mean, I would urge everybody that wants to know more about Kevin Sullivan and his family to read the story on backheel.com. It's pretty amazing. Uh, the writer, he went and spent a few days at the family's home in Norristown, which is actually only, uh, I used to live there before I bought this house. And um, his family's just amazing. Like his dad and mom are super supportive. They are soccer legends in their own right in the area. I think his his cousin or his uncle is Chris Albright, who used to play in MLS. I'll, I'll need to fact check that. Um, <laughs> and then... Like his brother, I mentioned Quinn Sullivan is already on the Philadelphia Union. He has two, so he has three older brothers. Quinn Sullivan's one. Two other brothers are twins. They play in MLS next, but they're not going to be like, I don't think they have the same ceiling as Kevin Sullivan. So it seems like he's got a great support structure and his family is soccer mad. So hopefully he doesn't find baking and go off on a baking tangent for the rest of his life. <laughs> I mean, yeah, true. Um weird example to use. I just needed something to throw out there. <laughs> um, but, and Quinn is his biggest cheerleader, which is really fun to see. I mean, Quinn posts all these highlights of Kevin all over his YouTube and like is always cheering him on, which is great to see. There's doesn't seem like there's any competition between the brothers to like, like have to be better than them or something like that. So um, that's really nice to see going forward. That match against Chattanooga is July 11th, by the way, um, one to watch, but yeah, I, I, I also like, want to point out that we've seen highlights a lot of highlights from sullivan i don't think anyone has a full game tape on him um and that but the highlights still are awesome <laughs> the highlights are awesome <laughs> I, i'm gonna be but... the hype person you're gonna be like jake pump the brakes but i'm like, the highlights are kind of insane <laughs> the highlights are insane but i want to see some like full matches he plays before i like really start to to buy in i think it's it's, it's great, and these numbers that Man City are throwing around are not the ones you normally throw around for a 14-year-old. So, I mean, there's something there, but, like, let's – everyone take a deep breath. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, well, I'm going to add one more stick to the fire because Manchester City is not, is not a club that would – put investment in a player like this that they haven't fully scouted that they haven't really thought about like his path into the team um i know for manchester city like one or two million dollars is not a huge sum of money but for a risk that a 14 year old poses to not pan out it is kind of an incredible amount of money to put down so i think like from the perspective of there are many smart analysts and scouts that work at Manchester City that have been a part of this purchase for them, that gives me some sense of like, okay, this kid is the real deal. It's not just U.S. men's national team fans that are hyping him up. I see, I see you smirking because I'm doing the exact opposite of what you just <laughs> asked me to do. But like, I, I think it does need to be said that Manchester City isn't going to splurge this cash on a 14-year-old that they don't believe has a path to their team. Yeah, you're right. It was just really, really a big part of the equation. I, I really wish I could be a fly on the wall of the room where they were like discussing whether or not to go for this. Just like hearing their reasoning for it would be really nice. Because I, I, you know, I just sort of right now feels like a crazy thing that they did this, but I know they have their reasons and I know that there's going to be, that there are a lot to legitimately be excited about. So it'll be interesting to see what yeah. happens going forward. Absolutely. All right, let's flip the switch a little bit. The U.S. Women's National Team last night took on Japan. Um, a, a few starting notes. No Corbin Albert in the starting lineup. She did get 12 minutes run out as a substitute when all was said and done. She was in the news recently, if you don't know, uh, for sharing transphobic and homophobic homophobic videos on TikTok. Uh, she also liked a meme on Instagram celebrating an injury to Mega Rapino. Many U.S. Women's National Team players, past and even present, they've come out condemning the behavior with uh, even Lindsay Horan and Alex Morgan hosting an impromptu press conference before uh, the She Believes Cup saying it was disappointing that the standards of the national team have not been upheld. So first question, uh, and then we'll get it out of the way. I also want to say this, like Corbin Albert, she's 20 years old. Yes, it was disgusting what she shared and did, but at the same time, 
if you apologize, if you really want to make a difference and change, there is room to do that. So I want to talk about this once and then kind of say like, okay, from here, let's give her a clean slate. Let's start from zero and see what happens. So Tom, should she be with the national team right now? I I think yes, but I clearly think that this is an opportunity for the U.S. to learn and grow as a group. I mean, it's horrible what she did, and I, none of it should be acceptable. None of it should be shared. If the, she's willing to have a conversation with them and willing to sort of grow as a person, then this is an opportunity for the team to come together to show that they can weather adversity to grow as a group and not like learn how to not have a fractured locker room with a really young core of players um it's going to be interesting to see how they respond so you know this is, provides an opportunity for them to do that so if they want to bring her in and have that conversation then this is a good as good a window as any to do that i'd rather have them do it now than in paris at the olympics all right case closed we're over it <laughs> past it unless something else happens in the future we're not going to touch it again to the game tom the u.s went down early <laughs> First minute goal from Japan's Kiko Sike, but fought back from a great Jaden Shaw equalizer from the top of the box. Looked like Christian Pulisic out there with that goal. And then Lindsey Horan in the second half put away a 77th minute penalty. They are through to the final against Canada, who beat Brazil in penalties after a 1-1 draw. For the U.S., they kind of bounced back from that World Cup disaster um, in New Zealand and Australia last season or last year. What does this mean to be like she believes cup? It's a friendly, technically friendly, uh, by the way, Atlanta, your, your place of that origin. Yeah. I don't know your place, your fandom, uh, mm-hmm. 50 plus thousand people showed up for a friendly for the Osons national team. Also a change of pace from the gold cup that we saw, um, where the, all the games were held in Southern California they were not attended very well, so to see this was great. But Tom, what did you think of the game, the goals, um, what this means for the U.S. Women's national team and the fans that showed up? I mean, Atlanta was rocking. That stadium is such a fantastic venue. It looks so good on TV, and the pitch even looked a little bit better than it typically does for United. So, But I, know I, go, I love going to soccer games in the Bend, so seeing the U.S. play there and play in front of 50,000 people is always special to see. Um, I hope that we get to see it more going forward because it's, it's a great spot. Uh, we're putting a training center there, so I'm I'm excited for the future of so- international soccer in Atlanta. Um, as far as the game, I thought it was one of the best games we've played in the last two years. It looked like a completely different U.S. Women's National Team. They were really dangerous. A lot of players looked really lethal. It was it was just kind of fun to watch against one of the better teams in the world. So I, I, there's a lot of encouraging stuff to come out of this. I mean, you can talk about the fact that we get players back from injury. We get Macario back. Mal Swanson is incredibly lucky, unlucky not to have scored a goal in this game. Trinity Rodman looks more like herself. Sophia Smith looked like she was re-energized. Jaden Shaw clearly is the truth. It Sam Coffey looks like a completely different player. I, I don't know. There's just a lot to really like about these players and what we're seeing from them right now. Yeah, I mean, coming off the the World Cup last year, I'm feeling so pessimistic about this team where are we going to go from here? What's the coaching situation? Now, I know Emma Hayes isn't with the team quite yet, but the fact that Twyla Kilgore has got this team kind of humming along with how they want to play with Emma Hayes in the future, the young players are really starting to come up and produce for this team. The fact that we could bounce back in such a way from that disappointing World Cup and still be kind of in the driver's seat to be one of the best teams in the world, um, that feels really good. I feel like I've kind of gone from full pessimism back to full optimism now seeing what this team is capable of and to be honest like the teams that we're doing it against are no joke we saw like we played against colombia in the gold cup as well one of the best teams that showed up at the world cup has one of the best young players in the world that plays at real madrid so to have this team show up again for the she believes cup um kind of fight back from an early one nothing down against japan who are really really good especially in transition, like that was a dangerous game to lose, especially going down. Um, So I'm just really happy. I'm just very feeling very optimistic, which I haven't felt about this team in kind of the last 365 days. Yeah, no, it's, it's great to see how these players have really come together, how we've got this young core that's sort of built up again. It's the sky's the limit for this group. So it'll be interesting to see what we 
do going forward, who makes the Olympic roster. I, I'm just excited about this group. Yeah, I mean, not to say that, not to get past this next game, which I want to mention is a full CONCACAF brawl with our sisters from the North, Canada. Um, kind of a classic game in the women's women's national team era. We are doing this in preparation for the Olympics, like you mentioned, that are coming up this summer. What do we need to see against Canada or because of how well this game went against Japan and the Gold Cup performances? Like, do you feel like the pressure is kind of off in this final where we just need to continue to play well and develop and the Olympics are actually the thing that we need to look forward to? Yeah, I think that this is all about developing for the Olympics. It's it's. The Olympics are the big tournament right now to look forward to. The Gold Cup is, or the the She Believes Cup is a big friendly. It's a it's a chance to play against some really good squads. But really, it's all about making sure these players have minutes together where they can co- sort of form those bonds, form those connections, and get ready for the bigger matches coming up this summer. And one one kind of wrinkle that I just want to talk about quickly is Jaden Shaw. You mentioned her is is the truth. Her normal position is on the wings, going back to positional flexibility. Um, Because Corbin Albert didn't start this game, Jaden Shaw was actually one of the midfielders, but it was, uh, you know, Lindsey Horan was obviously one of the more eights, like box-to-box midfielders. Jaden Shaw played centrally, so kind of a number 10. Does this kind of match some of the flexibility that we need to find and see? Because at the World Cup, one of the, the... the things that held us back, I thought, was our defensive midfielders or like our stability in the midfield. So finding someone like Jaden Shaw that can play the 10 and still get box to box and have some defensive responsibility. How big is that for the national team? I think it's big, but I also don't think that it matters that much if Katarina Macario is healthy because I think Katarina Macario does what Jaden Shaw does in the midfield, but does it better. Um, so having Macario back really does help us a lot with that and leaves us just a lot of options going forward off the bench. I think you have to have Haran in the game, but I don't think she can play as a six. So having a Macario or a Shaw who can come back and provide some defensive responsibility, but also take some of the attacking weight off of her shoulders is a really big thing moving forward. I mean, we're going to see players like Albert continue to get minutes, but I, I also think that the development of a player like coffee is huge for the U S because you know, Andy Sullivan did not get the job done at the World Cup. We clearly needed a true six. Coffee seems to be the heir apparent there, although there are other names that come to mind. Jalen Howell is one of them. Um, uh, Savannah DeMello did really well at the World Cup. So, yeah, there's there's options moving forward. Awesome. All right. Score prediction for U.S. versus Canada. That game is on Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Tom, who you got? I got U.S. 2-1. Uh, no dosa Sarah? No, no dosa Sarah. <laughs> I, I like I, I the, the Canadian team's too good for that. You got US winning as well? I do. I do. I I think two one's a good score line. Three two maybe. Might have a shootout. Okay. Not okay. A, not a penalty kick, but you know <laughs> a, a metaphorical shootout where there's lots of goals. I'm curious. Do you have a best eleven for the U.S. women right now? It feels like it's a really hard exercise to do to put a put together a best eleven for the U.S. women. Yeah, I feel like Nair and Gurma are my best eight. They're like ninety <laughs> percent of where I think my my best players are going. As long as they're in the game, I really don't care who else is on the pitch. Like I feel really good about the national team going forward. I think Naomi Gurma is like. We talk about Tyler Adams being so much better than everybody else. I actually feel like in the same sense, Naomi Gurma is that at center back for the women's national team. I think she's the future captain of this team. She just gives me so much like confidence that we are stable at the back, that anything can be snuffed out, that she has the passing range and ability to break lines. Like As long as she is there and Alyssa Nair is in goal with her incredible saving ability, like we're kind of set. It doesn't really matter who else is is gonna be playing in front of them to score goals. The the one tough thing about the World Cup is like we didn't play well until we played in the knockout rounds, and like our best game was in the game that we got knocked out. So I think like we've kind of just come back up the curve. My best eleven probably has Trinity Rodman in there. Um, I want to say Jaden Shaw needs to be on the field now with what she's co- showing, but with Mal Swanson getting back from injury, 
how, like they're really great conversations and great arguments to have, but like, how do you even decide who gets yeah. to be in that front three, especially with Alex Morgan still producing? Yeah, it's it's crazy how many options there are. I mean, how do you fit all these names on the field? I mean, Macario kind of has to be there. Sophia Smith is so lethal. Jaden Shaw, Mal Swanson, Trinity Rodman. <laughs> There's just so many good players for so few spots. And we're not even talking on youth like Alyssa Thompson, who looks electric whenever she is healthy and able to play. So yeah, it's there's there's a best not even 27. Getting, yeah, <laughs> Lynn Williams, Midge Purse, Ashley Hatch. There's there, there's so many names. That's not even touching on Mia Fischel, who's out with an injury right now. But when she yeah. gets back, she's another name Mia that Fischl. has to be in the conversation. <laughs> so yeah, it's I, I started trying to put together a best 11 last night. And I don't know if I can do it right now. It's crazy. Yeah, I feel like Germa is kind of like the only set. Yeah. Emily, set I put Emily Fox in there too. True, yes. Our upcoming Arsenal legend. I'm calling it now. Mm-hmm. She's going to stamp her name on it. All right, Tom, that is it for the show today. We're back. We're so back. Um, enjoy the eclipse tomorrow. What do you have to say Thanks. to the people? Last word. Last word. Uh, just happy to be back. Happy to be watching some soccer. If you want to dig a little bit more into the analytics of stuff, um, I started doing some writing. Not a lot, but if anyone wants to check out my Substack, um, Tom Talk Soccer, it's mainly about sort of ELO ratings and Tom model and stuff like that. So I'll make sure to put a link on Discord or something like that if anyone's interested in checking out some of the stuff I wrote when the interim between podcast episodes. So yeah, Jake, <laughs> I'll put it super in the happy pin to be comment. Back. Cool. Sounds good. Um, Jake, super happy to be back with you. I'm so glad that we can do this some more. It's, uh, I love that it's called Soccer Pod and can't wait to see what we ca- talk about in the future. Likewise, Tom. For anyone that has come back to listen to us after we are back from the dead, I just want to thank you so much for not just patience, but just all the love that you always show in the comments and the ratings. It really means a lot to us and it keeps us going so that we're not just talking out into the ether. And our words are going into that neutron star or a black hole that Tom is about to discover. So with that, we'll see you next Monday with the new episode of It's Called Soccer. Peace.